all set for takeoff tomorrow morning. It has sighted a promising planet. Stay tuned for further bulletins. Are we in orbit, Mr. Sludge? Yes, Captain Merrick. Excellent. Dispatch the survey team for three planetary cycles. It's been a long trip, and I hope it will prove worth the effort. Doctor, your report, please. This is the planet we are in orbit around. There are many things about this planet which are ideal for our purposes. The temperature range, the gravity, and the soil could easily support our food plants. The major stumbling block is the atmosphere. The atmosphere consists of a volume of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, a little less than 1% argon, krypton, water vapor, carbon dioxide, neon, and xenon, and trace amounts of carbon monoxide, ozone, methane, sulfur dioxide, Oxides of nitrogen, carbon, clay particles, bacteria and viruses, lead, zinc, iron, copper, manganese, nickel, tin, titanium, vanadium, and so forth. But that's terrible. Those substances that you say exist in only trace amounts are essential for our survival. True enough, but there is a most encouraging phenomenon. A subtle but steady change is taking place in the atmosphere. If this change continues at its present rate, we can assume in some areas of this planet, the air will be quite suitable for our survival. Amazing. What is causing this change? Difficult though it may be to believe, it is the dominant life form who is causing it. He is deliberately increasing the content of these substances in his atmosphere, even though they are toxic to him and to most of his fellow life forms. I can't believe that. It's true. To power his machines, he burns tremendous amounts of fuel and releases the partly burned waste into the atmosphere, enriching it with lead, essential to the prevention of overactivity in our species, iron, which we need for bone development, copper for our nervous system, and vanadium to toughen our skin, zinc to protect it, and sulfur for our digestive system. The dominant life form has found many ways to enrich the atmosphere, near the surface and in the upper atmosphere. This particular area of the planet seems to be the worst offender, but other areas are catching up. How has he existed if he poisons his own atmosphere? Uh, Captain, uh, let me explain something about the dynamics of this planet's atmosphere. 
It is in constant motion due to several factors. Surface conditions such as irregular distribution of land and water and their diverse responses to solar radiation or the lack of them. The ability of the surface to absorb heat and greater heating at the equator than at the poles. These factors cause widely differing local states of the weather as they call it. Circulations are superimposed on other circulations creating complex movements beyond description. When air is lifted and cooled, clouds form and they behave differently from time to time and place to place depending upon what pollution is in the air. They can be made to rain more easily and quickly or not to rain at all, to grow bigger, dissipate and so forth. It's a complex and messy system. It appears that the dominant life form is not generally aware that the pollution they add could radically change the distribution of rainfall upon which their society is totally dependent. Was the air once unpolluted? No, atmospheric pollutants have always been present in this planet's history. But the atmosphere has an excellent cleaning process to remove particle contamination. One is through rain. Water vapor in the atmosphere tends to collect on pollution particles to form droplets and crystals. By the time a raindrop falls, it is made up of a million little cloud drops. When rain or snow results, the falling precipitation catches additional particles and carries them back down to the surface. Some particles are blown against impediments by winds and filtered out. Other particles gather together until big enough to fall eventually to the surface. However, the dominant life form has discovered more and more uses for power obtained from fuel burning and he is in many places putting pollutants into the air faster than the atmosphere can clean them out. Doesn't he realize he is doing this? I mean, he seems quite sophisticated technologically. He seems to ignore it. Not only does he release all these pollutants into the atmosphere, but doesn't take advantage of the atmosphere's natural ability to carry away pollutants. What do you mean? I'll show you. In most parts of this planet, the higher the altitude, the cooler the atmosphere. Warm air from the surface rises, carrying with it pollutants. Stronger winds aloft carry the pollutants away from their source and they return eventually to the surface. On other occasions, and in some places, there is an inversion. The hot air which is now above keeps the air below from rising. Pollutants stay where they are. Yet it is in areas like this that he built some of his most heavily industrialized and vehicle-infested cities. Because he likes sunshine, he seeks out these places where sinking air prevents clouds and forms inversions, trapping contaminants. This sinking air keeps rain from forming and the air doesn't get cleaned. Incredible. Wait, there's more. Also, he is keeping pollutants near the surface by blocking out the heat with artificial fog or smog so that the earth can't be warmed to help mix the air and disperse the pollutants. He is actually changing local weather patterns in certain parts of his planet by adding water vapor or by direct energy release. I have prepared a small demonstration. When we cool the air containing water vapor, a fog or cloud forms, but it is relatively transparent and has only a few droplets. Now let us see what happens when we introduce some pollution into the chamber and the air is cooled. See? The vapor collects around the particles, forming millions of tiny droplets, making the cloud or fog more dense and longer lasting. What are the prospects for us? What are the chances that we can inhabit this planet? Captain, my unit has prepared a projection into the future of this planet based on current trends. Proceed with your report, Lieutenant. The atmosphere of this planet, though large, is finite. There is a fixed amount of air. The dominant species is introducing more and more pollutants than ever in his history. And as a demand for power spreads around the planet, 
the planet will become more and more livable for us and less livable for the indigenous life forms. Plants in contact with pollutants like sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen suffer and die. Lung damage to the higher species, including the dominant one, is inevitable. Pollution in the upper atmosphere is more persistent since clouds and precipitation do not occur there to remove the pollutants. This layer affects the flow of energy to and from the planet and may alter the overall temperature of the planet. That's the long-range picture, but short-range lethal conditions may arise if the dominant life form continues to ignore the meteorology of his planet and the atmosphere's ability to cleanse itself of pollutants. At some given time and place, the removal, transportation, and dispersion capacity of the atmosphere drops due to high-pressure calm or on extreme heat inversions while the pollution rate remains high or increases. When this happens, and with greater and greater frequency, the pollution rate curve comes closer to the removal rate curve. Plants may have their entire life cycle interrupted, or large population areas may suffer, as has already happened more than once. We are led to the conclusion that this planet will soon be suited for our habitation and unsuited for that of its present occupants. Uh, Captain, the command ship is on the line. I'll be right there, Smear. Yes, Command. Captain Merck here. Merck, the X-27 and the X-73 have both located possible planets. You must decide whether or not your discovery is a suitable site so that we can concentrate our efforts. If you tell us it is, we'll send you half the expedition to assist you. If not, you must go and assist the X-73. Let us know as soon as possible. Well, we've heard the evidence. Is anyone here opposed to calling this planet a suitable site in the near future? I am. Why is that? Because of a fact that no survey but my own has dwelt on. We have presented this planet's dominant species as a foolish race bent on self-destruction. But there is another side to him. He's not blind. There's a widespread concern throughout this planet. His engineers are working to reduce the rate at which materials are injected into the atmosphere. There are scientists called meteorologists among those fighting to convince others to make sensible use of the atmosphere's inherent cleaning ability and pointing out that the atmosphere's self-cleaning abilities are limited and that pollution may affect the weather. Observe now this electric broadcast of one of these scientists. How do you feel about the air pollution thing? Is it as bad as everyone would have us believe? Uh, had people, when they built plants or when they located cities, thought a little bit about the relationship between what they were going to do and the ability of the environment to cope with it or to maintain itself in some reasonable condition with people there doing the things they're doing, uh, they could have avoided a lot of this. You know, the, the atmosphere has only a finite ability to absorb the material we put into it. And as we keep increasing the amount of pollution in the atmosphere, we don't increase the ability of the atmosphere to remove the pollution. And we've reached a point in the atmosphere now where we're adding pollution at a rate about equal to, or perhaps in some locations and at some times, greater than the rate at which the atmosphere can either remove it and disperse it or actually remove it from the air through rain and clouds. Very interesting indeed. They are sophisticated technologically. They are not ignoring their problems and seem to have a means to solve them. They do. These scientists know a great deal about the atmosphere. Radiation balance. The atmosphere is a, a thermodynamic engine driven by the sun and by the difference in temperature between the equator and the poles. Well, now, if you suspend a lot of dust or create a lot of artificial clouds in some, in some region in the atmosphere, the result will be a change in the distribution of energy over the surface of the Earth, both the energy coming in from the sun and the energy going out in the form of radiation through the atmosphere. And again, we aren't in a position right now, our numerical models, our theories are not good enough to tell us exactly what the consequences of this would be. Yes, time is running out. Well, we have all the data in our computer. Let's ask for a readout on its decision. 
Suggest you join X734 in depth exploration of planet they have discovered. But return here after five planetary cycles to check on developments and fate of this planet for possible future colonization. Gentlemen, we have the decision. Prepare now to join the X-73. I hope our next visit here will prove rewarding. <laughs>